Hi, today after watching this video, you're going to know how to make a bread recipe that's hundreds of years old. It originated in the northern part of Portugal near the border of Spain. This area of Portugal is just beautiful. The port region is the door to the Duro Valley. It's called Roa de Milu, which is a bread with corn. The word Roa has a Germanic background, uh, meaning bread. Traditionally, this bread was made with rye flour, and in northern Portugal, it's still very common to have rye flour in the mixture. The Germans in that area of the world brought over the rye and rye flour, so that's how it got incorporated into that northern Portugal border of Spain, the Galicia area. It wasn't until the 1500s that Columbus brought over corn from America, from like Peru, Mexico, South America. So up until that time, northern Portugal, it was wheat, or that rye flour was very popular. Today I'm going to do two versions with the corn flour and also with the rye flour. It's a very rustic bread traditionally served with uh, soups like caldo verde which I have a recipe if you want to check that out. And this recipe is made with corn flour. So corn flour is different from corn starch. Corn flour is you know, you're basically taking like popcorn kernels and grinding it into a very fine powder. You know, it almost looks like all-purpose flour. Corn meal or polenta is a much coarser grind. So it's the same thing. This corn flour is the same as polenta or uh, corn meal, but the corn flour is a much finer grain. So that's what we're using today. Corn starch, they're removing all the outer bran and germ, leaving behind the starch-rich endosperm. So corn starch has very little flavor. That's why it's used as a thickener so much, because it has very little flavor, but it does a great job of thickening liquids. The corn flour, because you're cooking with that, you're still getting the nice flavor of the, the corn, the whole grain. And it's almost always mixed with some all-purpose or bread flour, and that is mainly because corn flour doesn't have any gluten and rye flour has a very weak gluten. We'll get started on this recipe. The first step to this bread is scalding the starch, either the corn flour or corn flour and rye flour. Not a very common, but it's definitely seen in baking. For example, pâte de choux in French baking, which is the dough that makes up puff pastry and eclairs, that is a scalded dough. When I made the risoge uh, de Cameron, you can check out that video. That pastry that surrounds the prawns is a scalded dough. Okay, the first step is weighing out our corn flour, tar it out, bring this to zero now. And on the one made of just corn and wheat flour, I'll put 300 grams. 300 grams of corn flour. Now this is gonna be the one that I'm doing corn flour and dark rye flour. So I'm gonna put 150 grams of each. So 150 there, rye flour. 150. Okay, I measured out 350 grams of water and got it to a boil. So I will mix that into my corn flour mixture first. Kind of incorporate that well. And you do want your water to be boiling when you put it in here. So I will cover this. It needs to cool down to like room temperature. In the meantime, I'm gonna put some hot water in the rye corn flour mixture. For the bread that has the rye flour in it, rye is known to absorb a lot of water, to be a whole lot of water. So I'm gonna put about 25 more grams in this bread. So it's gonna take 375 grams of water. This one naturally looks a lot darker. The closer, this is dark rye, basically the closer you get to the germ, the darker the rye. So a light rye is just rye berries, but when they mill it, they're just milling the outside of the berry, so it's a wider flower. When you get into dark rye, they're milling the entire berry. I'll cover with plastic, mainly just so it doesn't form any type of skin on there. And again, you want that to get down to room temperature, like at least 70 degrees, so it might take, might take an hour. Okay, now I'm gonna measure out my salt. I'm not gonna add the salt right away, but every time I work with bread, because sometimes I don't always add salt at the beginning, I always measure it out and put it in little plastic 
cups or you know any little vessel. That way I don't forget because you just want to keep it out, keep it somewhere obvious because there's nothing worse than you know letting a bread rise and proof for eight hours and after you cook it you realize you didn't put salt. 10 grams of salt in each bread. While the corn flour and the rye flour mixture are cooling down, I'm going to make what they call a sponge. It's kind of a way to kickstart your yeast. I'm going to rehydrate it, then introduce a little bit of flour. It kind of gives the yeast something to feed upon and just develop. So when we add it into the rest of the mixture in about 40 minutes, it'll have a quicker start. You could use one, one of these yeast packets for each flour. They have two and a quarter teaspoons. I have some bulk, so I'm just going to do that. Before I do that, a pinch of sugar. When I say a pinch, it's probably like an eighth of a teaspoon just to give something for the yeast to feed on. One, two, quarter, one, two, and a quarter. Okay, then I just give this a little bit of a stir. This water, 110 degrees. That's almost perfect. To rehydrate yeast, the ideal temperature is between 105 and 115. Again, I highly recommend thermometers. You don't want to get into the like 130 range for sure because yeast is a living organism and you could kill it if it gets that hot. So I'm gonna let that go for about 10 minutes. Then I had a quarter cup of water in there. I'm also gonna put a quarter cup of flour in each measuring cup to make like a sponge. If you're interested in other bread recipes, I have Bolge Lebge from the Azor Islands and also Bolte Kaku from Madeira. Check those out. You can see it's been 10 minutes since we rehydrated the yeast in one quarter cup of warm water and a pinch of sugar. And now I'm going to put about a quarter cup of flour in each of these. And that's, you can see that's just nice and foamy. The yeast is very active. Let a nice stir. Pour a cup of flour. And again, the way I'm creating this sponge is basically just to give the yeast a nice head start. You know, these yeasts are always multiplying. It's kind of exponential growth here. And by putting a little flour, you're acclimating them to eating the starch and the flour and just getting a nice start. So when we add it in, it is ready to go. Okay, it's been about an hour and a half since I scalded my starch. We just want to mix in our wheat flour, salt, and yeast. 100 grams of wheat flour, we'll just put that over the top. Sprinkle in our salt, 10 grams of salt. Gonna just mix that up a little bit. And now the yeast, you wanna make sure we get our sponge in there nice and even. And you just want to knead the dough a little bit. This bread is a little bit dense because, you know, you're only putting in, what, maybe about a quarter wheat flour. You know, it really doesn't have that much gluten. And I just want to form it into a ball. This needs to proof. And remember, ideal proofing temperature is between 75 and 85. That's ideal for growth of yeast and producing carbon dioxide. In general, with bread making, the longer you drag out fermentation, proofing, the more flavor there is from that fermentation process. You could leave this overnight or you know, up to 12 hours and it'll just slowly proof. And usually with most breads, like especially sourdough breads, you get a more complex flavor that way. This is like a barbecue thermometer. I'll put one of these probes in the oven, and a lot of times I'll put another probe in the actual dough, and I'll turn on my oven for about 30 seconds, and when this, when the temperature reads about 90, I'll turn it off, and that's my proofing box. And every once in a while, you know, if it's really cold, maybe I'll have to do it halfway through, turn it on, count to about 20 seconds, turn it off. But again, <laughs> make sure you turn it off because you're just making a proofing box. Another method is to boil a pot of water, probably like a gallon of water. Put your bread, put this dough cover in your oven on like a higher rack, and then put the pot of boiling water underneath. Radiant heat coming off that boiling water will make a nice proof box for you. Cover this, I'm gonna put, usually I, I always put like a damp towel over it, and I'll put it in the oven. Now we have our mixture, the corn flour and rye flour. I'm gonna mix in the 100 grams of flour, the salt, the sponge. All right, so the yeast is in there. Knead everything together. 
And this definitely feels kind of pretty tacky here. Form it into a ball. Put it in your proof box. Okay, the bread has been proofing. Under ideal conditions, I mean, the whole time the proof box has been about 80 to 85 degrees. So again, another way to do this is start making it the night before and then just let it proof overnight sitting out at room temperature. And you could let it proof overnight and even cook it for dinner the next day. So traditionally this bread is very crackly on top, very rustic looking. So I'm gonna sprinkle flour over both of them. Spread the flour on the bottom there. Like I said, my oven's preheated. The other thing is I have one carbon steel pan in there and one cast iron pan. If you have a pizza stone, something like that is a good option to bake this. You know, you can do a cookie sheet. All right, this is ready to go in the oven. And the one with corn flour and rye flour. Now that the bread's in the oven, I cook it at 500 degrees for about 20 minutes. And then I turn the temperature down to 450 degrees and cook it for about an additional 30 minutes. Ideally, you have an instant read thermometer. All you have to do is cook it until the interior temperature of the bread is between 205 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes. I lowered the temperature of the oven to 450 degrees. Just take a quick peek, see how beautiful it's already looking. It has that nice cracked look on top, gorgeous. Okay, I'm gonna check the bread. Just try to get it right in the center. 210, it is done. Let's pull that out. This is the rye. All right. Okay, don't these look beautiful? This is the Broa de Milu, and this is the Broa de Milu y Centillo. I believe that's the way you say rye. Total time in the oven for this was about 40 minutes. With the rye bread, it was about 45 minutes. Again, oven temperatures can vary a little bit. That's why I really like using thermometers. Between 205 and 210 degrees internal temperature, they're done. If you're only going to make one of these breads, I recommend trying the one with rye. I thought it was much more flavorful. Go out and make this classic from Northern Portugal. Thanks for joining me. Now go cook for someone you love.